Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. This is Mike Steckline from the Institute for Enterprise Excellence. Uh, today, I've got a special treat. I'm on site with the presenters at uh, Winnesheek Medical Center in Decorah, Iowa, and uh, we're going to have a terrific presentation. They've given this uh, to a number of audiences uh, around the country, and uh, this is a chance for us to feature their great work uh, today on this webinar. As far as some housekeeping and ground rules, uh, the phones are on mute, and if you have some questions you'd like to ask, you can use the chat function. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, and it's going to be available for viewing and listening uh, for anyone who would like to have the link, and we'll be sharing that afterwards. Uh, previously from Winnesheek Medical Center, and you can see it was around Christmas time, um, there was already a presentation uh, webinar-wise uh, from the rehab department uh, here at Winnesheek Medical Center. So these folks are not unfamiliar with our, our processes and our work, and we appreciate this group today um, providing the terrific presentation that I know everyone's going to find uh, to be beneficial. Uh, before we get into their presentation, I just want to review a little bit about some of the things that you're likely to see and connect it back to one of the models that we um, talk about in our work. Um, so this is uh, the model we call our sustainability model. And today I know you're going to be hearing a lot of bit different components from the model, um, but as I reviewed what they're going to be talking about, um, they're going to be talking about some of their systems that they put in place and also some of the tools that you'll see within the system. And I'm sure they're going to be covering some of those other topics as well. Uh, from a broad view, um, this is some of the things that they're working on. If you see the diagram toward the uh, lower uh, left side, you can see that uh, with any organization, there are leaders, uh, managers, frontline uh, categories. And this is intended to um, describe, in an ideal world, where would people be spending their time primarily? And uh, we would like to have leaders primarily focusing on tomorrow's problems, anticipating and preparing the organization for the future. Uh, they will have some role to play with the daily management system, which is uh, indicated by the green triangle. Um, but it's not going to be daily problem solving or daily managing per se that is going to be taking up the brunt of their time. Managers um, on, in the middle part of the diagram, they have sort of a 50-50 role. Um, it's their responsibility to translate the key strategies from um, the leader, leadership of the organization and then uh, coach and help the frontline staff who are going to be the primary people every day that are doing the frontline daily management system. And then in the middle, um, everyone's going to have some type of standard work system that they're doing. Um, the diagram at the top is intended to expand what you might see in a daily management system, say that green triangle toward the bottom. And uh, as we show on this diagram, there's going to be some sort of uh, tie to a strategy, a st strategic alignment at the top, perhaps through a dashboard. Are we winning or losing? Uh, then there's going to be some discussion around that board and usually in huddles, uh, which involves communication. And it's that communication system that is the primary focus of today's presentation, although I do know that they are going to be getting into some pro basic problem solving that they have been doing and uh, some of the other um, items that are illustrated on this uh, slide as well. So I just wanted to give you the larger pic picture context for what you might uh, hear about today. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to our presenters. Uh, the first one going to be presenting is Lisa Radke. Uh, and then also with me here in, uh, in Decorah are Sue Heitman and Dave Rooney. And they're going to be um, taking the, the controls of the presentation now. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Radke uh, to give us some um, introductory remarks. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, we are very excited to be here today essentially sharing our humble learnings and an experience of learning that we've had, especially addressing, as you noted, uh, communication, and specifically through a tiered communication process. So as you noted, uh, we're joined today by Sue Heitman, our Chief Nursing Officer, and Dave Rooney, our Administrator for Operations. And to start us out today, we'd like to reflect on a story. This is perhaps a story that's familiar to those who are joining us on the webinar today. So, Sue, I'd like to invite you to tell us about a story that began in our emergency department. 
sure. Oops, let me see. I went too fast. So this is Sue Heitman, um, and I'm going to set the stage with a, what I think is maybe a typical story for people. Um, this is something that happened to us here, and it's been quite a while ago now, but um, a patient presented to the ER and needed to go home but had no means for going home, and the staff at the time did not know what resources they had available and who might pay for that transportation and were pretty flustered. And so like they often did, they um, felt like that was their manager's problem to solve. And so they wrote a note and left it on their desk. And as is typical, I'm sorry, I'm going too fast here. I've got to get the feel of this. Um, the manager put it on a put it on agenda for a next biweekly meeting where the nursing leaders meet. But as often happens, that agenda was pretty full and the group got occupied with approving a policy. And as you can imagine, sometimes those are, um, we don't always agree on them and they take a while to work on. And so we put that ER transportation issue on the back burner, diverted it to the next meeting. And that meeting maybe got canceled due to scheduling conflicts. And then what happens? We're a month out. We didn't solve that. And once again, a patient comes into the ER and nobody um, had a solution for how they were going to provide transportation on the way home. And so as often happened, staff wonders, does anyone really even care about our problems? And what do leaders do all day? You know, I told administration about this. What on earth are they going to do about it? So that kind of sets the stage of um, how tiered communication may help with us and then this type of problem solving. So. Tiered communication is a way for frontline staff to communicate daily with leadership, not put it on somebody's doorstep or on their chair for solving later, but a daily way to communicate. It's typically done in a huddle format, and we really limit that time to 15 minutes. Um, we follow a standard format, and we use standard questions regularly that keep us informed on quality, safety, the state of the house, status and flow, things like that. It can be led by anyone. It's customized by, um, for different departments and units, and um, it doesn't take the senior leader to be there. So why does our story matter, Lisa? I'll turn it back to you. Yes, thank you, Sue. And in particular, I would say that a sign of a success, as you had indicated, is when it is led by other people than the managers. So just by way of example, in our administrative huddle, this can be led by any member present. It might be a member of our community relations team who is in the same hallway as our administrative team. It may be a member of our administrative assistant team as well. Uh, so it doesn't have to just be leadership. And this is a true sign of success that when the leaders are gone, the huddles still happen. The communication processes are still happening. So what makes this so important is to look back at what was happening in our organization. And we believe we're like many others in the same way. Anyone who ever does a staff satisfaction survey knows that communication is often one of the top three items to be improved. Seems we can never over communicate. And some of the challenges that we were having included that our results were trending down. So staff satisfaction. Uh, some of our concerns about physician recruitment, our financial numbers. And of course, this is important to us, and we said we need to do things differently. So of course, we looked to lean improvement in healthcare, which is very important, and it is something that we started to do. We had some level of success, but really we focused on tools like many other organizations. This is helpful, but it's limited. And until we changed to more of a focus on systems and using this as a system, we really fell flat. And in particular, a change that we felt we needed was in how we communicate with each other. And we needed something that we could scope to our unique needs. How could we make this work for us, where we often say we're an organization that is too small to be big, too big to be small, so how can we do this in a way that will work for us and it's seen as something that's just part of what we do. It's not an add-on. So we have found now that this is easier for us and that idea of wearing multiple hats, which we often have in organizations our size, 
ends up being a very good thing because we're able to tailor this to uh, the work that we do. And our experience is, is that out of this, we've had positive feedback and results. So we just want to share this with others. And today, we'll actually have an opportunity to share some of our results specifically to workforce fulfillment or staff satisfaction, uh, the timing of implementing our communication uh, system, particularly a tiered communication system, fell very nicely with the timing of our staff satisfaction surveys. So just a little bit about Winnesheek Medical Center. Who are we and where are we? So we are a charitable, not-for-profit community hospital and clinic. We serve Northeast Iowa and Southeast Minnesota, and we've been around for a number of years, since 1914. So we're going into our uh, second uh, 100 years here and very proud to be serving our communities. We're the second largest critical access hospital in Iowa. There are 82 critical access hospitals in the state, and we are owned by the citizens of Winnesheek County. So a county-owned facility, that means we certainly need to pay attention to the work that we're doing and the success that we have. We're uh, very blessed to have an active medical staff of more than 30 Mayo Clinic Health System and Gunderson Health System physicians. So we work very closely uh, with our physicians in our practice. And in particular, we have what are called management and professional services agreements with Mayo Clinic Health System Franciscan Healthcare. This is a very important relationship for us. We work closely with our colleagues uh, in performance improvement and lean processes uh, in La Crosse, uh, Wisconsin, as well as part of Mayo Clinic Health System Franciscan Healthcare. And we also have six regional outreach locations, so we'd like to show you a little bit of, of where we are in context of uh, the United States. And you see here also last year we were named a top 20 critical access hospital by the National Rural Health Association, which actually invited us to share our story of success. And it was this story of tiered communication that we were able to share at the National Rural Health Association conference in uh, Kansas City in September and then thereafter just recently in Phoenix at the American Hospital Association Rural Health Conference. Um, so the, the success we've had has been able to be shared with the world. So where are we specifically? So we look at the midsection of the country and you see us in northeastern Iowa. And as we look at our specific uh, sites that we have here, we have outreach locations. We actually do serve in podiatry up in La Crosse, Wisconsin with our colleagues at Mayo Clinic Health System Franciscan Healthcare and provide outreach to uh, sites in Wakan and Prairie du Chien, also part of Mayo Clinic Health System Franciscan Healthcare. And you can see there the hub in uh, Decorah with our clinic and hospital services, and then many rehab, uh, sports medicine facilities, as well as other outreach settings uh, in Northeastern Iowa. So we have various locations, which truly adds to the complexity and importance of creating communication systems that considers all locations. So Sue, would like to have you tell us then, what does this look like on a daily basis? What are we really talking about and how does this impact all of our sites? Sure, thank you, Lisa. So typically, um, the tiered communication would start out at a shift change, and it, we initially called it a stat chat. Um, it takes place at shift handoff, usually at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Mostly we do 12-hour shifts, but other departments have different start and end times. So sometime at shift handoff, and it's typically one shift to another. Um, they huddle around a performance board once a week if they are well developed into that system. not I wouldn't say all of our departments do that, but most of our departments now are doing this daily stat chat every day. Um, and it's shift handoff, they have qu standard questions and they raise up quality safety issues, potential pain points, and then just basic status and flow. Then that is tiered upwards to um, from this, those their supervisors that are taking that, that's, shift handoff and they tear that up to the next level 
and that would be probably um, supervisors to a director sometime around eight o'clock, although that varies with different people's workflows and the supervisors then huddle with that department manager. And they too follow standard questions and it's a report up type of a thing. The questions are a little different. They're maybe a little more global because we're asking several departments for information. And then the next tier is a tier two stat chat. And this now is happening. One of them happens at nine and one happens at 915 for sure. And then the managers and their administrative lead meet at this time. And again, they ask each other standard questions and have a chance to touch base daily. This is one of the tools that you'll see there now that was developed by one of the groups to guide their conversation. And it also helps them reflect back from the day before or the week before to see if they've really touched base on things, maybe like pain points or needs that really needed some follow up. Um, this is a picture of the tool that I developed. Um, it just helps me receive information in a really concise way as well as have room for notes. And um, I change it every so often when I'm gonna try to do something different, particularly in relationship to how I wanna spend my time with Gemba and um, making sure I get to all of my departments. I find myself now putting yellow sticky notes on it because I have another system that I work with that. And Dave has a system that works for him. I, I have to comment here that, you know, in the early days of understanding this work, especially lean principles, I went to conferences and I knew if I just had somebody's tool, I could make this work. And I have had to change my tool so many times. I think it's the idea that you have a tool that's important, but what it looks like is more important to what you need it to look like. So make one that informs you and helps you do your work. Then finally, we all bring this back to our tier three stat chat, which it happens at 935 daily, and we all huddle. This is in our administrative hallway in the picture here, and we tear up all of the information that we've received um, at our different huddles. So the administrative team is here, plus our ad admin assistants join us, and then working in our hallway is our, our community relations folks as well, and, and it's been found to be very valuable to have them with us. Um, and this, to kind of, draw attention to what we talk about, what we have found really effective is once Dave and Lynn and I, who have all had some type of a tier two stat chat, bring what we have back and share it, we often recognize that we have shared issues that um, we make sure we resource the right way so we don't have two people working on the same issue, things like that. We get answers. So the story I set the stage with to begin with was one that helped happened early on and just by bringing that story to the back to our stat chat because somebody lifted that as a pain point we got an answer right away and that was solved by the end of the day it was the auxiliary that has the taxi vouchers and we just needed to close that loop um, it, I would say that was a, a early win for us to help us recognize the value of this type of a communication system and then we also um, have found a lot of efficiencies in, in lifting up when we have open positions and getting, getting permission to fill and we don't have to send a bunch of emails around or find people because we can have that quick conversation at our um, tier three stat chat. In addition to that, we've, um, we try to lift problems up and you'll see on the right side of this board, we are trying to do some um, problem solving and, and we weekly do our problem solving huddle around this board too. We do that on Wednesdays and, and we're starting to add more and more um, inflection points to this huddle. So we've added a, a credentialing update on Tuesdays now and more people will join the huddle on that day because we, we, they know everybody's gonna be there and we'll talk about it. So we're starting to, to grow our huddle to be more than just status and flow of the day. So often people get answers right away and that's been one of the really nice values of that. So what are the benefits of the tier communication? We've noticed that we have fewer meetings. I can talk, speak to for the, the folks that I work with closely. Um, they would have to find time on my calendar to run something by me and, and it would be frustrating and there would be delays. Because they know they'll see me daily, they'll save that question because we will have time for that because we've created a really efficient way to take care of the status and flow stuff in our tier communication that we now have time for a little bit of discussion in that 15 minutes. And so we really eliminated the need for so many formal meetings just to do routine problem solving. 
We get rapid action on issues. We have a lot of staff engagement now. They see us working together. They also know that that's when things are going to get talked about and lifted up and they might get some answers after these huddles happen. More staff engagement and empowerment to make changes, lead a problem solving initiative and have support from us to do that. And as I said earlier, we're, we're visible, we're seen as more approachable because we're seen in the areas. We try to always have these huddles in one of the areas that we lead. So we don't have people come down in our office and do them in secret. We're out in a public place doing these. Um, I don't do this high kick like Fred Astaire, but we would say that you too could find the success that we have had with tier communication. So Dave, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you, Sue. Um, this is Dave Rooney. And so you might ask, why doesn't every organization do this? Seems pretty easy. Common sense, right? Well, to make com uh, tiered communication work, you really uh, do need to be intentional. Um, senior leaders um, really must commit to changing their behaviors. It, uh, re senior leaders really need to uh, model the behavior that they are uh, trying to create and deploy throughout the organization. Leaders need to be uh, spending time daily in, uh, in their departments. And leaders must really, uh, as I mentioned, follow and um, model principles. Tools are only secondary, as Sue alluded to earlier. Um, success uh, truly depends on a team and not a single person. As Lisa described, our, our huddles will uh, take place whether the leader is there or not. And that is really imperative that it, it's all about the team. Um, finally, um, it's essential to uh, create and follow standard work that results in meaningful questioning um, in a safe environment. And ultimately, this leads to continuous learning and to a learning organization. So, um, a, a key uh, for those of us who have uh, worked with the Institute for Enterprise Excellence and Mike, which is uh, most of us on this webinar, um, we're familiar with the shingle model and principle based architecture. And we would say uh, here at Winnishik Medical Center that uh, principle based architecture has truly helped leaders at WMC act our way into a new way of thinking. So this uh, visual, visualization of the uh, shingle mm -hmm. model is also probably familiar to uh, many of us. And um, this model has helped Winnishik Medical Center to be able to, uh, to some extent, get up on the ladder and see the whole versus the parts, or in other words, to focus on our purpose. After all, we really can't go anywhere without purpose. The sustainability model of see, do, and get um, has really fostered the principle-based architecture, or fostered through principle-based architecture, has helped leaders to learn to uh, focus on purpose. And our primary purpose is to be the most trusted partner for healthcare at Winnishik Medical Center. This illustration uh, reminds us of the uh, three dimensions of of the principles. Oops, I'm one off, aren't I? Okay. Um, this illustration reminds us of the three dimensions of the principles of uh, enterprise excellence, and that is align, enable, and improve. And we've learned that the business principles and behaviors uh, of the three dimensions can be categorized by the consequences that they, they impact. We have also gained an understanding of what happens when you focus on just one group of principles versus a focus on principles and behaviors under each dimension. So Dave, if I may, if just to go back to that slide for a moment, this is Lisa. You see some of the principles that are highlighted here. When we're building our systems, we've learned the importance of being able to say what principles are most touching this particular system. So relative to our communication system, under alignment, we identified the importance of constancy of purpose, that we really want to focus on that. And enabling the importance of respecting every individual. 
if we're going to have success in our communication, we have to have a sense of safety and a sense that every voice is heard and thus the importance of respecting every individual in our communication system. And then under improve, as you can see here, focusing on the process and embracing that scientific thinking. So those are principles. They're all important, of course, but really highlighting those principles under each of the three dimensions to help us plan for the communication system that we have. Great. Thank you, Lisa, for that um, addition. And so by focusing on principles and behaviors that really touch all three of the dimensions versus only focusing on one of the dimensions, we're able to increase uh, our velocity of influencing uh, change and, and achieving results. So perhaps one of the greatest learnings um, along our journey has been that real change comes from uh, individuals doing new things. Sue, I'll turn it back to you and how we did this uh, with our no meeting zone at Winnesheek Medical Center. Sure. Thanks, Dave. So, you know, we had to create this space, right, to do the, the stat chat in the morning. And, and I like to tell the story. I can remember vividly that we were at a leadership retreat two years ago now, and we had heard about this no meeting zone idea, and, and we were game. We wanted to try it. And so, um, first of all, we had, to, we had to create space in our calendars. Dave and Lynn is, and I especially are all hit the ground running type people and we, we, we loaded our calendars up right when we got here and we were really busy and we thought that we had to do this in the morning and sure, we'll commit. Well, it was easier for me to commit because I was new and I hadn't filled my calendar up as much, but Dave and Lynn had and I can remember the look on their face when we said, let's do this, and their feeling was, okay, that's fine, but now what am I going to do with those two hours and when am I going to get that work done? In reality, um, we have found pretty quickly that we have more time for meaningful work now that we spend our time that way um, during our, our morning tiered communication cycle. So what do we do with this time now? We aren't in every one of those tiered communication stat chats. So we have a little more time to understand the problem instead of solve the problem. We don't put out fires Nearly, I'm not going to say we don't put out fires because we do, but we don't do it nearly as much because we do more coaching on how to, why did this happen? How are we going to prevent it to ha from happening again? What have you tried? Things like that. Um, I also would say for me personally, being newer to the organization, developing the behavior to do this during this no meeting zone, I, it, it started out as social. People needed to get used to seeing me, right? Because they weren't used to seeing me in their place daily. And I, now I started rounding daily. It's a great way for me to get to know people as I was new. And then we started asking questions and then people got a little defensive. And, and so we had to get used to that a little bit too. I wasn't asking questions because I was trying to root out problems. I was just trying to understand the work. And now we're really starting to develop into it being true Gemba time where it's not just asking questions about numbers. It's asking questions about the work that people are doing and understanding the work that they're doing and what might be the barriers to doing their job well. So our learnings really changed our perspective and we talked about this. We had this no meeting zone and, and, and that's what that started out as, but we've changed the name of that now. We no longer have it on our calendars as a no meeting zone. It's protected time in our calendars. It's rare that we will let anybody schedule time into that. And we now truly call it Gemba time. And we really feel like we're, we've worked into that time being more like Gemba, where we're really going and seeing what the work is. So when Lisa was talking about um, that, that, that uh, value of respect and, and how that's so important, I, I had to smile on that because it does take a receptive attitude to be able to do this well. And so again, I'll tell a story on myself. We're having these, our, before we really got this into a system that we feel we are presenting to you now, we had an initial, we met at our board, we had that behavior and we were meeting and we were really just talking numbers and we weren't doing as much with those numbers, but we were asking questions of each other. And I had to learn to not feel attacked when those questions were being asked. And, and they were asked in a way that was leading us to, to question why it mattered. And you have to just be comfortable with people asking questions and asking why. Um, and that, that has been some real growth on all of our parts, I'd say. We have to understand that those questions are not personal. They're not personal attacks. They don't mean that I'm doing something wrong. 
and don't, don't jump to defensiveness right away. And I think we're all modeling that really well with each other, that we, we are now able to do that in front of others who can see that we don't always have the same idea, but they can see how we can work through that in a problem solving, respectful manner. Um, we also, it, in this team idea of the work we do, it allows us to put our stories together to identify the real issues. I have a lot of the um, nursing side of things and Dave Rooney has a lot of the other clinical areas. And so you might hear a story that happened on the night shift in the lab and from the lab's perspective. And then I hear it from the nurse's perspective and then we put it together and we can get to true problem solving because we have a more well-rounded um, look at what the issue may have been. And we certainly can take care of risk events much sooner. We, we lift those up as soon as possible and, and people are used to making sure we know things if they're concerned about them. So one of the things we talk about is leadership standard work. And I think this group, because of our work with Mike and our connection with this topic, we all understand what standard work is, but let's talk a little bit about leadership standard work. So we know standard work is about job breakdown instructions on how to do a job every time. We all know this, but the leadership standard work gets us to asking questions such as, is the standard work happening? How can we fix this? What's the next step? Asking those types of probing questions. The leadership standard work has to evolve, it has to be fluid, it has to be system-based, not tool-based. Um, and so I thought I would give you an example of maybe one of the ones that we've worked through. So in our emergency department, um, one of the things that we, they started tracking early on when they were trying to manage daily improvement and, and one of the, the things that they put on their tool was if any of their high-risk events happen on a ship, they were like, um, high risk, low volume kinds of things. And um, one of the ones that came through there was that they weren't doing universal protocol on all the procedures that they should do. So what are the, were they going to do about that? They did create standard work on it. They talked to the standard work, but then were they doing the standard work? And so that we folded that into our leadership standard work. They created their job breakdown on that. They talked to it, as I said, and then the supervisor would look and the director would look every day, did we have one of those events last night? How did it go? And then that that went up to my tool as well. So I knew that that was on my radar. And while we were hardwiring that, I would go through there every once in a while and I would just ask staff about it as well. In addition to make it got recorded up at my tiered stat chat. So that's just an example of a, a real granular leadership standard work type of an exercise that we did. So Dave, what really makes it take off? Well, I think we would all agree that uh, early success is uh, breeds uh, faster and future engagement and more success. So ideally, when we're trying to implement a change, um, we will um, we would like to create a pull for that change versus a push, and so. Um, any change is better received if managers see the value in the uh, tiered communication. Um, so the, the, you could put the sta make the statement that uh, this would make whatever your problem is so much easier if we can understand the value. So we have found that uh, what administrators find interesting, staff and managers find fascinating. So when we are out in the Gemba asking questions in a very safe environment, a safe manner, uh, and staff or leader, other leaders may not necessarily know the answer, there you can be assured that they know we will be back because they're becoming more acclimated to seeing us on a regular basis. And they're going to say, next time, I want to know the answer to that question. Can I, yeah, can I just interrupt you, Dave, because I think some growth that has happened in the last probably six to eight weeks that since we put this presentation would be one that you reported on today, where um, Dave is now has the cadence in his stat chat with his leaders of talking NOI on Fridays. And that would be a great example of that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Sue. We have uh, um, improvement. We, have, we call it a financial challenge uh, at Winnesheek Medical Center. And our goal is uh, to keep a, uh, an intentional eye on our net operating income on a regular basis. And so in our group, our tier two uh, huddle, we um, talk on Fridays about um, the status of what each department is working on and where that individual department's financial challenge is at. And so 
uh, we had that opportunity to uh, discuss that this morning. And I was able to bring that then to our tier three huddle um, and uh, explain where our departments uh, were at, um, you know, as far as their efforts in the financial challenge. Um, so, as I mentioned, when managers and staff see senior leaders asking questions um, and becoming more knowledgeable, they become more engaged because they, we all like our to uh, like people to understand what our work is like. And so, when when managers um, and staff see senior leaders taking the time to ask questions and become no, more knowledgeable about operations on the front line, they're more likely to they like to tell their story. So. We have a department um, that uh, is a particularly good example of where a uh, poll was created um, and where there was a poll for deployment of principle-based architecture. And uh, Mike referenced uh, the Rehab and Sports Medicine team, which we heard from um, in December. Um, they have proven to be a group of early adopters in principle-based architecture. And so they've effectively deployed the tiered communication and problem solving and achieved, achieved some pretty exciting results, um, which we're uh, going to just uh, touch on again here. So um, when staff see the value in an effort, they, as we mentioned, they're more likely to uh, become engaged in uh, solving those problems. Um, you know, a key opportunity for the rehab department uh, was identified as a part of the uh, all staff survey that was completed in the fall and we received those results in um, January and that uh, key opportunity involved burnout. So what do we do? Uh, a large part of the issue that was identified with burnout had to do with um, scheduling and communication. So they developed a staff led daily huddle, which has evolved over time. So staff engagement in the huddle really came from understanding what is relevant um, to my day and not a focus necessarily on what uh, some may perceive as uh, endless or meaningless met metrics. And so that involved a daily review of workload and um, pain points to s try to identify opportunities to make their day better. better. So you might say, so what? What were the were we able to get results? And I would say, um, yes, we have uh, had we have been able to achieve some results in that group, or that group has. And uh, the uh, uh, all staff survey uh, questions around burnout were really fell under our workforce fulfillment uh, pillar. So one of the questions involved uh, openly confronting and solving problems. Um, and in that, under that category, 86% responded positively. And this was up from by 26 points um, from the survey taken in uh, 2015. So feeling free to speak my mind without fear of negative consequences was up 23 points compared to the survey in 2015. And that was really uh, came about, those results can really be attributed to focusing on the principle of respecting mm -hmm. every, ind uh, every individual. Another question uh, on the survey, we admit and learn from mistakes, up 21 points. Um, that we really, uh, there was an intentional focus within the uh, rehab group uh, on the principle of assuring quality at the source. So an 89% positive response rate. And finally, a spirit of cooperation and teamwork, um, and again, an 89% uh, positive response, uh, up 23 points, and that we attributed back to a focus, an intentional focus on the principle of thinking systemically. So let's take a look at a couple of our other organizational pillars uh, that they focused on. Under health outcomes, um, there's uh, a lot of work that's in process uh, under health outcomes, and that is a focus on improving functional outcome measures. Um, and that was an area where um, a uh, problem, the, a frontline staff member brought a problem uh, to the to the uh, huddle surrounding functional out measurement of functional outcome measures, 
And specifically, there was a question on the accuracies, accuracy of the scores. And this proved to be a significant problem and not uh, an easily solved problem. Um, and so that generated a work group to really uh, lend some focus and, and dive down into a, a root cause for that. And that that is an example of a problem that could have gone on for a very long time. But thankfully, the frontline staff member brought that to the huddle and the work group was created. If I could just interject, I think this is a really good um, example of of spread and learning from each other. Um, as Dave said, our rehab department, they were early adopters to this, this way of thinking, this way of problem solving. And this functional outcome measures um, or FIM scores that are done on our patients in um, our skilled setting in the hospital side is something done collaboratively with nursing. And nursing was not as skilled in this way of thinking or problem solving this way. And so it was a great way for them to bring them in and work through an A3 process for them and, and to see the effectiveness of working that way. Thanks, Sue. So um, another example under uh, patient experience where this uh, tiered communication has been uh, proven to be quite valuable um, was illustrated um, in a reduction in uh, repetitive or recurring patient complaints. Um, an example uh, that the group worked on was where um, a frontline staff member brought forth a uh, concern or complaint from a patient uh, that involved billing, uh, brought, um, brought that to the uh, frontline or to the huddle. And uh, in the previously, that problem, that type of problem would have been brought to the manager for the manager to solve. The manager would have consulted with the billing department and perhaps got back to that staff member and it would have been done without uh, closure uh, with the rest of the, the department. And it would have, uh, things would have gone along just fine for a while until the problem came up again and the manager would have ended up with the problem on her desk again and went through the same cycle. And now what happens is the uh, problem is brought to the huddle and it, the entire team is talking about it. The problem ends up being resolved and there is standard work around uh, communication back to the entire team around that process so that it doesn't end up reoccurring. Um, there's also been a more intentional evolution to um, proactive problem solving. So rather than just reacting or waiting for uh, patient, ex uh, patient experience issues to arise, the team is talking more proactively uh, around, um, you know, mitigating uh, those types of situations. So uh, under operational effectiveness, we've also seen some financial improvements. Um, from uh, we've seen a reduction of uh, salary expense to net uh, net revenue ratio, uh, resulting in a savings of approximately three hundred ten thousand dollars from fiscal year two thousand fourteen to two thousand sixteen, um, and um, this was achieved really by focusing on uh, the behaviors and the principles that we talked about. As you can imagine. Um, there may not as be have been as much frontline engagement if the manager had gone to the staff and said, said to people, hey, we need to reduce salary expense to net revenue ratio. They would have looked at her and probably not uh, embraced it quite so warmly. But by fo identifying and focusing on the key behaviors and the principles, we've been able to see financial results as well. And then finally, under uh, growth and funding our future, uh, we've seen an increase in uh, total net revenue of about 35% in that same two-year period, which uh, contribute quite positively to uh, the True North stat strategy of improving NOI. So, Lisa, I would uh, turn this back to you to talk about some results in our Environmental Services Department. Great. Thank you so much, Dave. This is very exciting for us that we have experiences that show results in our non-clinical areas, at least direct patient care anyway. And uh, with our environmental services team, they implemented their uh, communication system. They have their huddle processes in place as well. So between October of 2015 and October of 2016, we saw very significant improvements. Overall satisfaction, 93% responding positively, 
and this is an increase of 26 points. So there's a sense that overall I'm satisfied with my experience at Winnesheek Medical Center. And then organizational culture, 100% responded positively. And we were doing well here to begin with. We improved by seven points, so we had a good start. But to hear that 100% are positive about culture, which basically says that we are respecting each other, we're treating each other with a sense of dignity and respect. Managers to staff, staff to staff. That's the experience we would want our staff to have. And then similarly with uh, discretionary effort, it's kind of a fancy word, but essentially means that we are working toward doing whatever is necessary to improve our care. And so we had a response here, 67% responding positively. That's up 14 points. But we went from just over half of the staff feeling that way to now over two thirds. So we're making gains in that area as well. And then finally, a sense of engagement, 93% responding positively, up 20 points. So the sense that I want to be involved in making things better here, there's a sense that I can make a difference, my voice matters, I am involved in decision making, there's a sense that what I do matters in terms of the outcomes that we experience as an organization. So we're seeing these kinds of results both in our clinical areas as well as in our support areas as well. And when we have positive results, we know that for our staff to have a sense of fulfillment, that's the experience we would want them to have. When that's happening, we know that then all those that we serve also have positive experiences as well. So we would like to move from this to saying, what is it that one can do right now to begin to make a difference? So what could we start doing tomorrow? So first of all, from a leadership perspective, to commit as a leadership team to implement uh, a communication system. In our case, we chose to do that in the tiered way, as Mike shared at the very beginning, frontline staff, our manager staff, to the senior leadership team as well. And it doesn't have to be big. So one of the things as we started out was that Gemba time going to where the work is, and then really staying with it. And then we'd invite you to consider that this doesn't have to be the entire organization in the beginning. As we said, if you have someone who's ready for this, start small, even if it's only one area, and we can begin to see change, and then we can help each other in that process. We've worked very closely with Mike. We've been blessed to have his leadership and mentoring along the way, and how is it that we can transition from that tool-based to principle-based problem solving. So we use a lot of the uh, white papers from the Institute for Enterprise Excellence, and Mike guides us along that path very well so that we can learn to start small and experiment, and from that we can gain a great deal of success. Uh, Dave, I'd invite you to share about an experience that our leadership team had in reading the book Designed to Adapt, Leading Healthcare in Challenging Times. Sure, thank you, Lisa. Um, a few years ago, um, the organization, as we were starting our lean journey, um, the organization made the deci decision to uh, try to get a common uh, platform for Is a problem solver, uh, emphasizing the idea of learner leader teachers who are experts within the organization um, who help facilitate frontline problem solving, and then to emphasize that the job of a leader is to remove barriers and really empower those on the front line to solve real problems. So again, that was a, a, a very influential resource for us to get started as an organization. Thank you, Lisa. Yep, thank you, Dave. Uh, it sounds like we might have lost some audio there for a moment, but I think we're all back now. 
Um, so essentially what we're talking about here is where is the pull in the organization? Who are needing the help? How can we uh, implement this in areas throughout the organization? We had a great experience of that pull just shortly after implementing our processes. And Sue, you can tell us about the story of the Joint Commission coming to visit us and uh, how we worked through our opportunities for improvement there. Sure. So um, as Lisa said, the Joint Commission was here. And um, as we were looking at how are we going to manage all of the opportunities that they gave us for improvement, we we decided to pull in a tool that might be helpful. And the group that was leading it was um, interested in Kanban and what that would be. And so we introduced that and we set up all of our um, the things that we needed to do to comply with the Joint Commission on a Kanban system. And we moved everything through that in 15 days. And it, we used a huddle system around it a couple days a week. And we just had a short 10, 15 minute huddle. And we moved our problems along till we had, you see on the right side, um, to almost all complete in 15 days. Those ones on the left side that are ready were true opportunities, not mandates. So I, I just need to point that out, those of you who have been through the Joint Commission. So it's just a, an example of pulling the right tool for the right problem to solve. Great, thank you, Sue. And I think also a good example of how we can use our experiences uniquely to each situation. So when we have uh, urgent kind of matters that come forth, the communication system that we have lends itself very well to that and we can make uh, changes to help us in short-term situations such as that that we had with the Joint Commission. So what are some of our lessons learned? And it's important to note that we are always in a learning mode. Uh, first of all, that changing behaviors is more effective than implementing a new tool. We had to change our behaviors as leaders. We had to get out, out of our offices, out uh, daily into the departments, meeting with our managers, meeting with our staff. And once we were able to do that, then we could really begin to see some important improvements. Uh, modeling and communicating the principles to managers and staff early on. So it is, uh, people will look to us and if we're modeling that, then we're certainly going to show that this is something that's important. One of the things that we are doing with the principles right now, and this is some help that Mike has guided us in, is tying the, the principles for uh, enterprise excellence into our values in particular and then every month focusing on a principle of the month so that we can help learn with each other. Uh, so we're learning collectively as well. And that helps to carry things uh, through in our organization uh, so that we have um, managers, leaders attending all levels of the stat chats that we have. We have an opportunity every day to highlight successes. Might be a story. Sometimes we call those our cool stories. Uh, something that we've seen in the way of our teams working well together. That recognition can begin right in the department all the way up through the leadership huddle. Uh, we recall that diversity is a good thing in our stat chats, basically that they don't all have to look alike. Standardization is great, and at the same time, if there's something that's not meaningful in one of our huddle processes, then let's not do it just for the sake of doing it. So we really create systems that are important and most meaningful at each level. And in healthcare organizations such as ours, uh, the more we can involve our physicians in the process early on, the better that can be. And yet that can be a challenge, particularly in a 24-7 setting or when we're busy in the clinic uh, throughout every day. So we consider what that inclusion can be. It doesn't always have to be in the way of a physical presence. So by way of example, as we have implemented a problem-solving process within the clinic, our uh, physicians are able to post a note about something that might be concerning them or a problem that we have to solve. And then the clinic staff can look at that. It's a post-it note begin to address that and then have a way that we can get back and solve that problem in a more timely way. And then also communicate that back to our physicians. I would say the greatest lesson of all is being okay with small incremental changes. So it doesn't have to be everything at once. We experiment in small ways, short term, 
and uh, that that's going to help us really be able to learn from each other. Uh, and it's always a learning for us. Uh, so we're always growing. Uh, the idea here is to focus less on the numbers and huddles being more fluid to really tend to what is most important for staff today. We're learning to cross-pollinate, so it doesn't have to be just one department. So by way of example, if we're making a move from uh, one department to another, let's invite our information technology team to the maintenance huddle so that we're all on the same page. How might the uh, IT part of the business be impacted by this move? Uh, these are just-in-time opportunities. We recently had our IT team at an administrative huddle to address an upcoming downtime process. Uh, safety security will come to our administrative huddle to plan for severe weather situations, which in our part of the nation can certainly happen. So the fact that we meet every day means we're present and we can pull people in and people know that we're meeting. They can come to us and share concerns right in the moment. And then as we've discussed before, our one-to-one -one meetings with our managers now focus more on strategy, proactive kind of focus versus a firefighting or problem focus. So we've had great benefit from that as well. Uh, in closing, we just would invite at this time questions, discussions, Here's some beautiful pictures from Iowa, and uh, we always like to say if you're in our area, please do uh, come join us. We'd be happy to show you around our beautiful part of the state of Iowa. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, thanks Dave. We've got a few minutes here. I'm looking at the, um, the chat function. We've got some questions. Uh, what have they stopped doing that allowed time to have two hours a day to do Gemba time? <laughs> Everyone's chuckling. <laughs> I would say for me, formal meetings that I, I can handle with just touch points like the, the, the tiered stat chats allow. I would say for me, it's um, along those same lines, but we I find the need for fewer meetings uh, because we're able to deal with things in more real time. I have fewer one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, uh, so meeting with uh, individuals once a month versus weekly because we have these daily touch points as created space. It's not to say it didn't take more time in the beginning to get to that culture. I mean, we didn't, we didn't, day one didn't result in fewer meetings, so it did take a little longer in the beginning, but we've definitely reaped the benefit of it now. Lisa, anything? I think part of it, too, is changing practice. So it's easy to come in the first part of the day and think, oh, I've got all these emails I need to tend to. Well, once I get on the computer and start that, it's hard to get out of the office. So when I can go out and be present, I find that a lot of the answers or questions that might have been on email now are able to be answered right there in person. It's a lot more efficient. Okay. Uh, there's another question, uh, willingness to share leaders, leadership standard work anywhere from the supervisor level on up to the organization. I think these guys have been pretty willing to share uh, examples of what they have. Uh, don't want to speak for them, but uh, you guys can chime in. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've shared mine and had requests for it. And okay. That's true. I would thing. caution to make it your own, though. Yeah. With some caution. Yeah. Worst thing you can do is try to copy something that may not work for you. Um, Phones are open, uh, unmuted, if anyone has any questions. Um, otherwise, I'll go to from some follow-up slides. Okay. So what happens next? The recording from today's terrific webinar is going to be moved over to the recording section on our website that you can find there uh, on this link. And uh, the next um, presentation is going to be friend and colleague Debbie McAllister, uh, at the end of this month, in on March, March 31st, uh, some um, advice on uh, coaching and the power of vulnerability in coaching. Um, we're doing a webinar. It's a series of webinars we've been having on strategy deployment, and this is a summary of date um, some, from some of the key lessons learned thus far. For we call it uh, Pracademic's Guide to Strategy Deployment Part One. So that's going to be April 28th. Um, and also in May, uh, Sammy Bari, uh, Dr. Sammy Bari is a dentist in uh, Florida, terrific fellow. I've heard him present multiple times. Uh, he's just recently published a second version of his book. The first one was called Follow the Learner, uh, 
this is uh, the lean dentist, um, and uh, he's going to be talking with us in May, uh, the actual date uh, time uh, to be determined, but we know it's going to be May the 26th, so I'm working with him on that. Um, our latest white paper, uh, folks today have mentioned white papers. Um, we wrote a white paper called True, True North that you can find on our website at that page. And uh, we're working on that uh, follow-up white paper on a pracademics guide to strategy deployment. Um, final slide, if you have anything that you'd like to share or a suggestion for something you'd like to see shared, um, you can send it my way. And also we have a um, space on uh, a group on the LinkedIn. If you want to be a part of Pracademic uh, uh, Learning and Sharing Network, you can participate that way. So with that, again, I'm going to thank our presenters today from uh, Winnesheek Medical Th Center. Um, they did a terrific job, and um, I will send the link to this recording and uh, any attachments that they're willing to share, such as leader standard work, out to the community. So thanks again to our presenters, and I uh, hope everyone has a great day. And if you're traveling, uh, travel safe. Thanks again. Thanks, Mike. Mike.